Hi, I'm Colleen Deli, host of America Media's Inside the Vatican podcast. Welcome to Behind the Story. Last week, the Vatican released its long-awaited report on former Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. The report detailed how McCarrick was able to rise through the ranks of the church hierarchy, even as rumors swirled about him abusing minors, seminarians, and priests. The report reveals that John Paul II knew about McCarrick's misconduct, but chose to promote him anyway, and that Francis and Benedict, when they became pope, trusted that their predecessor had looked into allegations already, and so they didn't bother to investigate. As we know, as soon as an allegation of McCarrick abusing a minor was deemed credible, Francis took action. He removed him from ministry, from the College of Cardinals, and eventually from the priesthood. Joining me today to discuss the McCarrick Report is Juan Carlos Cruz, who is a, an abuse survivor and an advocate for abuse survivors. Welcome to the show, Juan Carlos. Oh, thank you very much, Colleen, for having me. We're glad to have you. I want for our listeners for you to just uh, give us a little bit of background on, on who you are and, and how you got involved in, in advocating for survivors first. Well, as you said, I'm, I'm an abuse survivor myself, and um, you know our case has been pretty um, pop, uh, famous in the news, if you will, um, where Pope Francis went to Chile. I, I live in Philadelphia, but, uh, but he went to Chile um, and said that we were um, saying calumny about one of the bishops that had covered up all our abuse and stuff. And um, and shortly after he went back to Rome and and sent Archbishop Shikluna and uh, Monsignor Jordi Bertomeo and they did sort of a McCarrick report but uh, confidential um, and discovered that everything obviously was true. Um, the Pope um, uh, sent a letter saying he had made a big mistake. Um, he had the three of us in, in with him for a few days, and then he asked for the resignation of the whole bishops' conference in Chile. And then uh, after that, you know, things have evolved, and we can talk about that if you like. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that you drew a parallel between the report that uh, Archbishop Shakluna, who was kind of the Vatican's prosecutor in this case, or investigator, mm -hmm. um, that he drew up on your case because it was what, 1,400 pages, right? We saw the McCarrick report last week was 450. So these are, these are huge swaths of information. No, no, no. About it was 2,600 pages. 2,600. Goodness. I don't know where I got the 1,400 number no, from then, I, but huge, huge amounts of information. And so, you know, you've also seen kind of a parallel that you've talked about in other interviews um, between what you would like to see happen with your report and with the McCarrick report, right? You, you want to see these reports both become public, not just the McCarrick report? Yeah, I, um, I think the McCarrick report was uh, very well done. And we can talk about the, the, the details after. But I think uh, the McCarrick report has set a very high standard um, and a pretty minimal standard at the same time. Uh, hmm. for justice of survivors, right? And the McCarrick report, I think, cannot be the only one. I think it needs to be what survivors um, get from now on. It can't be just, a, I know it takes time, I know it takes resources, but I think survivors deserve it um, and justice deserves it. And I think, um, you know, um, people should be able, not just a, a few privileged, but everybody should get a report like that. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean when you say it was kind of a, a minimal standard, but also a high standard? It's high in that we haven't seen it before, but it's minimal in that it's what people deserve? I agree completely, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you then about, you know, it seemed like we saw a, sort of a significant change in, in Francis. And obviously, this is me kind of trying to read into what's happening in his head. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Um, but... It seems like with your case, we saw a big change in him when he had this report come back and he realized that he had been wrong to dismiss your claims. And And I can't help but see a parallel between that and when I read the McCarrick report, hearing that, you know, until 2017, Francis was hearing these rumors about McCarrick, but, but never really bothered to look into them. And then as soon as one was deemed credible, all of a sudden he starts taking action, right? He, he dismisses McCarrick from ministry and then he... Uh, asked for his resignation from the College of Cardinals, and then he 
uh, eventually removes him from the priesthood. And so I, I wonder if you could speak to that at all, since you've gotten to know Francis fairly well. You know, do you think that there's been a change in him on on taking abuse seriously, or maybe you know how urgent he thinks it is? Well, I think um, he's always uh, taken abuse seriously, but um, unfortunately, he was um, pretty misinformed by his colleagues, if you will. Um, and that is very frustrating because um, in our case, I know the Cardinal in Chile who was his friend and whom he trusted uh, lied to him through, I mean, in every single possible way you can imagine. Um, and, and so <clears throat> I, I, I feel that, that Pope Francis has uh, you know, uh, has done a lot, um, especially since I've known him. Um, he's done Vos Estis Lux Mundi. He's, um, he's uh, eliminated the pontifical secret, you know. Right. These are some changes in, in church law that have provided for, you know, greater transparency and also put in place a system for bishops to be investigated by other bishops still, but for bishops to be investigated um, cor- for correct. cover up, which was not in place in 2002, correct. we should say. Correct. Correct. And so, so what, I, what I think it is very frustrating and, and at the same sad, the time sad, and I say it, you know, as a Catholic who, 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 who loves, uh, you know, the, the, the church and the good people that work in the church. But there's um, so many bishops, and I saw this at the summit, that um, go to Pope Francis and um, they say, oh, yes, Pope Francis, absolutely, this is what needs to be done. And then they go back to the curia or they go back to their diocese and they, it, it remains the same, no change, no nothing. I'm not saying that that's everybody, but there's a high percentage of that. And it's very frustrating. You would think Pope Francis can do it all and can do it, and he can't because he needs the collaboration of, of these people who are not willing to do it. Right. I mean, we even saw, you know, with the McCarrick report, it was really delayed. And we we found out that Francis faced a lot of internal resistance to even releasing it. And so I think that's a really legitimate fear that you speak about that, you know, not only in the case of the abuse summit, which you mentioned in in February 2019, when the Pope brought all the world's bishops together to try to get them on the same page about abuse and brought him and brought them in to listen to survivors. Uh, By calling to his, but to his credit, he yeah. did release it, and he. Oh, for he, sure. He no, I, and I know you're saying that, but, but he did. I'm just putting an accent on. He did release it because, and those those who were, um, you know, blaming Francis of this of that, like for example, Archbishop Vigano, who has uh, auto proclaimed himself the 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 United States Pope, or something like that. It's very frustrating and these followers of Vigano, these bishops, the one in Tyler, the one here, the one there, uh, where are they now? Have they said sorry for having insulted the Pope and and gone with um, Vigano's cowardly um, allegations? These were people who, like Vigano, for example, he was here in the middle of the worst of the crisis. Did he do anything? No. And now that survivors are useful, to further their agenda, they pick up survivors. But if survivors um, are not useful anymore, they'll pick up something else. And so I hate that they use survivors as pawns or props. I hate it. And it's very um, evident what they're doing. Yeah, I, I want to circle back to that. Um, what, what I was saying before was just that I, I think that the fear that you expressed that things will go back to normal, right? Uh, not only the after the uh, summit, but also after this report, right, that they would go back to being less transparent, that they would go back to being so secretive. I, I think that that's a fear that a lot of us are going to be looking to see what, what happens next with this. So let's talk about uh, Vigano, since you brought him up. Um, you know, you're right, he did, he he used abuse claims, right, to to try to undermine Francis because he doesn't like him for for whatever reason. Mm. And we saw a group of US bishops, I think about 12 of them, come out in support of Vigano. And so that is an open question. You know, we found out in this report that 
Vigano was actually told by the Vatican to investigate an abuse claim in 2012, and he didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet in his, his letter that kind of sparked the McCarrick Report as the Vatican's response to it, he claimed that, you know, he was kind of the only saint in the Vatican, right? He was the only yeah. one who was who was uh, actually taking this seriously and actually saw McCarrick for who he was. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have a, a question to ask you about this, but I think it is important that we talk about this. I, I, I think Viganò needs to put away his um, halo and and step down from his soapbox and um, and acknowledge that he is wrong. And um, he is not only wrong in that, but he's um, exacerbating um, these conspiracy theories and stuff. But I, I, let's not veer to polit politics. But, but in terms of what happens with survivors, I mean, um, he fuels... Um, uh, you know, situations with survivors and uses them. Um, and these bishops that should be uh, doing more seriously for survivors and um, being in lockstep with what Francis is trying to do, um, they stir away from that following, like I said, this autoproclaimed uh, United States Pope. And, and it's just very frustrating because um, now survivors are important, but when they were, or when he was here, they weren't. Mm -hmm. Now, let me ask you, you know, we've talked about how you'd like to see these reports, similar investigations happen and be made public, uh, and that you'd like to see the resources go into those. But you talked about bishops that you want to see be in, in lockstep with survivors. What other ways would you like to see that happen? Oh, I, uh, gosh, it, it, it would be. Um, I know it's a I big think, question. Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I, ha I want to start from the premise that everybody deserves justice when they've been abused or wronged in any way by uh, members of the clergy, bishops, um, cardinals, or priests, or whomever. Um, and, and I think they need to take it seriously. I feel that Sometimes there's abuse fatigue, and mm. because it has gone for on for such a long time, because not because of survivors, because the church has been so slow in doing something, um, you know, there's uh, a fatigue in the sense that they say, "Well, haven't we uh, done so much in hurting, you know, the poor priests or poor bishops? The reputation is terrible." Well, an I work in, in, in a company, in a multinational, and I'm in charge of, uh, you know, reputation, communications, brand, and all that. And trust me, if you don't fix your brand, uh, if we could talk about the church like that, um, you're never going to move on, uh, which is what we all want. But we can't move on if we don't um, uh, have some sort of justice for every survivor and not for just a few. Um, we know that the U.S. bishops are meeting this week. Uh, I, I'm wondering if there's any initiatives you'd like to see come out of that meeting in response to this. Um, um, I, I just want, would like to apply what there is already, but apply it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and also to find a way to um, auto-policing themselves is kind of weird. Um, yeah, uh, to me, that, uh, that always seems um, uh, strange. I mean, because you saw in the McCarrick report, I mean, um, how is Theodore McCarrick? And he got these glowing letters from bishops that knew him and had even seen uh, reprehensible behaviors let's say that's what they call it, but it's criminal behavior. Mm -hmm. And they did nothing. They just wrote glowing reviews about this man. And so um, auto-policing is, um, I, I, I don't know if I trust it. And so- Yeah, you're certainly not the only one who, who feels yeah, that we way. Need, we need to find ways where, where, I don't know, there's a task force that comes in and says, um, who uh, independent uh, boards of more women, more lay people, more, you know, 
uh, smart people that know what survivors go through, survivors, um, you know, that type of thing. Because uh, when you auto-police yourself, you're lax on certain things that you don't want to hurt a friend or you might be, you know. So I think it's important that, that we take what we have seriously, but that we implement them in smart ways um, so we're credible and so we find justice for survivors and so we repair the very damaged reputation that the church has. So Juan Carlos, let's um let's talk about some of those changes that Pope Francis has made. You know, there have been so many since 2018. It kind of feels like they they happened really fast. Um, you know, there we saw votes at Sislux Mundi, which was uh, a change in church law, right? That uh, that set in place a, a structure for bishops to be investigating each other and kind of set in place a system where you could report one bishop to another bishop, which is still this question of auto-policing, right? Um, but I think it also called for more lay folks to be involved. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what other what other changes that the Pope has made or that, you know, have been made in the U.S. church uh, have you seen that you've thought would be useful? Well, I think um, what you just said is is right. Uh, what, but, but we need to implement it very well. Um, and there needs to be, like I said, more women, more lay people that are uh, knowledgeable about the topic um, and not skewed towards, uh, oh, poor priest, you know, he's gone through so much or poor bishop, you know. Um, we have a culture of cover-up and a culture of abuse and that needs to stop. Um, and let me tell you, as a survivor, uh, the abuse is horrible, but the cover-up is as terrible as well. And so uh, it's incredibly frustrating. And uh, when I was reading the, the, the report, I was um, again reminding myself and saying, no wonder they didn't believe us because they all act so well among themselves to protect each other. And, um, and you're viewed as the enemy of the church, the one, look, I am Catholic, my faith, um, you know, I, I'm no saint, of course, but 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 I who is <laughs> but but I I I love my my faith. I'm um, Mary, for example, for me is just such a critical aspect of my uh, um, you know journey towards the Lord, if you will. I've remained Catholic through thick and thin, um, and I do want this church to to. Um, heal. Uh, but there cannot be healing if there's no justice. And some people say, well, these people want revenge. No, no, no one wants revenge. People want justice. And that is really important. It's like this, this typical example that we always give, you know, the, you have cancer in, in one part of your body, um, they take it out, but you have to have chemo uh, or other treatments to rid yourself of, of the whole cancer from everywhere, right? Um, and we're not doing that um, in, in many cases. So that's really important. The pontifical secret is another uh, big deal. Um, the, uh, to me, the lack of collaboration of bishops who uh, say yes in front of Pope Francis and yet uh, do nothing um, in, in their places of where they should be doing. Again, not everybody, but many. And that is really frustrating. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things that I often find really frustrating when I'm when I'm covering this, right, is we often see Pope Francis take this sort of slower approach um, on abuse. Like, he'll put in place the legal systems, but he's a big believer that the more effective thing to do is to change the culture, right? Which is what we saw when we were both in Rome in 2019, when he brought all of the world's bishops to come listen to survivors, to come, you know, really learn about how this is an issue and an issue everywhere that, that no bishop could say, oh, this doesn't happen in my area because it does. Um, you've seen bishops then go home and, and not follow through with these, these orders that have, been put, that have been put in place. But we're also seeing a Vatican that's strapped for resources and, you know, is is less into centralizing government, right? And that, so that's a good point. I wonder how we how we balance these things, and I don't I don't 
think that you or or anyone else has just a simple answer yeah. for this, but I think I that's a big I question. I don't have I don't have the solution, Colleen, but I do think that you, you know um, when I um, I told my two friends, Jimmy and Jose Andres, the uh, I said no, let, they're not Catholic, so. Mm -hmm. They're like, I told them, no, but let's go to the cardinal. He's going to hear us. He's a cardinal. He's going to hear us. So let's start there. I mean, this is such a big issue. Let's go talk to him. And when he did nothing and started covering up and we discovered he, he's been a criminal since, uh, you know, a lot, a, a, lot, a lot earlier than we went to him. Um, you know, it's really frustrating that that still is going on uh, at the Vatican. And you're right, I do believe Pope Francis has a way of let's change culture, let's, let's um, uh, you know, I'll provide everything, but you know, he can't work alone uh, right. because he can't be everywhere at every single time. And he's got the weight of the world in his shoulders too. I mean, abuse is, is a horrible um, issue. But there's other issues that he needs to be involved. So it falls on these um, collaborators that should be helping him do it. And that's where, um, you know, uh, things go weird, if you will. Some do it, some right. don't. And sometimes you and feel... it seems it seems unlikely that we would see, you know, something like what happened with the Chilean bishops where he brought them all to Rome and... and... Yeah they all resigned right like right. even then we still right. haven't seen a lot of those resignations be accepted i think they're still going through a process of trying to like weed out who the bad ones were um, that's right that's yeah right. and it's like can you do that with with the whole world's bishops yeah. i just don't no. know i i don't think you can and then yeah. there's this heavy resistance uh uh from bishops who like you said earlier say uh, it, we don't have this situation in in ex diocese, uh, Mr. Bishop, let me tell you, you do. I, I, maybe there's a diocese in the world, thank God, that doesn't have this, but abuse is also present in society. So you have to work, uh, you know, it, it, it should be a priority for you in any case. But, but uh, you know, and another thing that, um, you know, I've um, encountered, Colleen, that is very frustrating when bishops try to explain them their inaction uh, and they say to me or I, when I've been in panels or, or, or somewhere else or I hear them, well, you know, in the 80s, the 90s, we really didn't have protocols to um, help us deal with something like this. And to me, that is just the most frustrating thing that I can hear because we know that molesting a child, a, a boy, a girl is wrong. And like I always say, it's been wrong before Christ, after Christ, Middle Ages, 1800s, now, and it will always be wrong. So mm -hmm. if you don't have as a bishop the capacity of seeing that and taking strong action uh, to deal with that crime, what are you doing as a bishop? Please leave. We don't have room for you here. Right. Your conscience should not depend on what the protocols are. Exactly. Juan Carlos, I, I really appreciate being able to get your insights today and, and hear your perspective, not just as a survivor, but as a Catholic, as an advocate. I, I think that you offer an invaluable service to the church, and, and I'm grateful to have had you on. So thanks. Th thank you, Colleen. I, I, I love uh, my faith. I love uh, it, it, it. Sometimes it's it's. Um, better sometimes it's worse but but I love my faith I love being Catholic and I want our church to heal but I also want survivors to get justice and I also want um, people to feel happy and safe in our church and so whenever I can I'm going to keep talking and I thank you and your colleagues for for having me and and helping maybe someone that's hearing us right now says, oh, I want to speak up and I, um, and we heal, we help someone heal. So thank you for doing all these things. All right. Thank you, Juan Carlos. And thanks to our viewers at home for watching. For more videos like this, subscribe to our YouTube channel. 
And for a deep dive episode on our podcast Inside the Vatican into the McCarrick Report, check the link in the description below. You can also find full coverage of all Vatican news and the McCarrick Report at americamagazine.org. For America Media, I'm Colleen Dully, host of Inside the Vatican. We'll see you next time.